compared to the time we used before the break, before the fall break, to talk about hypothesis tests for one and two means and confidence intervals. We spent a whole uh, three sets of lectures on talking about that. Now, I, in five minutes, that's 0.5, I told you how to do hypothesis tests and confidence intervals for the intercept and the slope. Whoa, five minutes, where I basically were told the same thing as I spent three lectures on before the break. But that's because I assume now we start getting used to the fact that we can do hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. And in a way, we do exactly the same thing but with slightly different computations of the standard error and then the different uh, de degrees of freedom, but otherwise it's the same in a way. The, the, the framework of thinking of hypothesis tests and uh, confidence intervals is the same. Now it is just related to the slope and the intercept of a line and not just the mean. Remember that the slope and the intercept of the line is the kind of the mean of the data in a slightly more sophisticated way, right? It's, a, it's an X-conditioned mean of the data, in a way, uh, if you want. Um, so, we can take this a step further to the, I showed you already the red and the green uh, curves on my initial plot uh, when we started. These are taken care of by these titles here. We can talk about confidence intervals and prediction intervals, not for the slope and the intercept separately, but putting those two pieces of statistical knowledge together and say something about the line. What is the uncertainty about the line position and value? And we do that first. We have a method for that. We talk about the confidence intervals, not for beta zero, not for beta one, but for a point on the line for a given weight value. So we decide for a point on the line, an x value, and say, hey, can I give a confidence band for the line? Of course, I'm going to use the standard errors from the intercept and the standard errors for the slope here together, because both of them enter the line. That's, the, that's in a way the math of it. And here comes the formula. Again, we don't prove these things. You can find it in the notes, but it's not required of you to dig into and know about the details of these proofs. You can it's just do realize what the results are. And the result is here. Here's the formula that there is a standard error for this line, statistical uncertainty for the line, which in a way has some elements both from the intercept and the slope uncertainty in it. Look at this formula. And also, I mean, if you looked at the formulas for the standard errors for beta 1 and beta 0, the sigma hat is part of it. The sigma hat is the estimate of how far away from the line that points are on average, right? So it's a bit of the size of the point cloud. If the point cloud is very close to the line, so a very nice situation, right? The sigma will be small, right? If there is a wide point cloud, the sigma is big, bigger at least than this, right? Small sigma, whoa, big sigma, right? So of course this, this raw variability in the system that we're looking at will be a part of the uncertainty of the slope and the intercept also. So, so, so that enters, of course, but other thing enters. This is a confidence interval that will contain the true, say, let's speculate, let's take uh, 180 centimeters. I would like to estimate the mean weight of all people that are 180 centimeters based on my regression data, based on the data I have and my regression model, right? How would I estimate the mean of these things? Well, I would plug in, I would plug in the 180 centimeters. Let's say x0 equal 180 centimeters. What would be my prediction? That would, of course, be this minus this beta zero hat. Now, I don't remember the numbers. Beta one hat times 180, right? That would be, I would plug in the x and get a predicted weight. But then I have to realize that is not, that comes with uncertainty, right? 
But the nice thing about the regression model is that I can, I can estimate the mean weight of people being 180 centimeters, even though I potentially didn't even sample one person of 180 centimeters. I may have sampled all other persons, but my assumption of the line makes me that I can in interpolate. Interpolate. I can do that. That's the, in, that's the purpose of the model. That, that, that's pretty fantastic that I can estimate the mean weight of people being 180 centimeters without sampling any, even one of them. And then I can put an uncertainty on it using this formula. So this is the, how to put an uncertainty on the mean weight of people being 180 centimeters. I'll show you in a minute. We can take it out of R also, of course. But now you know how to compute it yourself. It's not part of the start output, as I showed you. It's not there to be. And you have to plug in the X. And by the way, how would it be? Let's think about that. R remember that my X bar, I believe, was 178 centimeters for these high weight data, right? So the best possible one to predict is the one on mean height, right? If I predict the value, the mean weight for people at the mean height, that is 178, this term vanishes. And that's the small possible, smallest possible error I can achieve. But if I try to predict something of very, very tall guys, I mean, at the end of the interval, I shouldn't go beyond the interval. I've told you that. But I mean, hey, I could try the formula, of course, but that would be questionable. But at least I could take it to the end of the interval. That will give me higher uncertainty, right? It's a kind of, uh, I mean, the line is a bit uh, positioned in the middle. So uh, the way it can be different from time to time, the uncertainty about the line is higher in the end than in the middle. It can move like that, and it can move like that. And, but this movement doesn't change much in the middle. <laughs> All it changes in the end, right? Wegstein, you can see. What's the English term for Wegstein? Weight change. <laughs> Probably not. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> now, here's the complicated part of it. I think you would probably accept what I just told you, because that was the natural generalization of estimating a mean, like we did before the break, that we have a mean and we have a uh, confidence interval. Maybe you now, by now, you've gotten used to doing that. Hopefully. Maybe. Hey! But now that we do regression, actually also before, but we didn't do it, but now it's more obvious that maybe, just maybe, we would like to use the line in a more ambitious way than what I sketched before. Before I used the line to estimate the mean weight of all persons being 180 centimeters, the population mean. Now, I could be more ambitious. I could ask you, how tall are you? And you would tell me, I'm 180 centimeters. Today you are. And then I said, hey, well, then I can use my model to predict your weight. Right? That's also a use of the model. I'm going to use my model to predict a single person's weight. Models are used like that in the production line at uh, Lundbeck, for instance. I'm not hired by Lundbeck, so I can mention them without, many, without saying that. Um, where they may measure something on the individual tablet, and then you have a prediction model to predict the amount of uh, active substance in a specific individual tablet. Uh, so you use linear regression models to predict what goes on in the individual thing, person, or tablet. Now, how would we, how would we compute that prediction? Well, I would say no different from before. I would use the line, of course. So the value of my prediction it's uh, whatever, 80 kilos or whatever the model would say here. I would use the same value for you, for the prediction of you, as I would use for the prediction of the population of you and all your friends. The other guys being 180. The average of all of you guys. I would use, of course, because what should I use otherwise? That's my best guess. The line is the best guess. But in my thinking of the error I could potentially make in predicting your weight, I would have to be bit uh, careful now, because you come in with some individual variability, right? Guys of 180 centimeters, they're different from person to person, right? There is a net, and how are they different? Well, they are sigma different. 
That's, that's my sigma, my sigma measures. How different are guys at 180 centimeters, 180 centimeters on average on the weight? Hey, they are sigma different. It was 3.9, my sigma in my model, right? So I would have to realize when I predict single persons, they come in with a, an additional difference with the 3.9, the sigma. Hey, that's easy then. Here's the sigma. This is the same formula as before. Formula, and then I just added a one, and the one gives me a sigma because of the parentheses there, right? So it's the same uncertainty formula with a sigma added to it. That was the sigma that gave me. Here's for the here's the confidence interval and the prediction interval. Confidence interval, prediction interval for the same data. Predictions. Individual predictions, we call them predictions. And our uh, interval uh, confidence, uh, our uncertainty interval about predictions, we call prediction interval, will be more difficult. They will have higher uncertainty. If I took a sample of one million persons, I could be completely certain about the mean weight of any guy, any type of guy. So by having increasing n, I could get the confidence interval to be as small as I want if I have the money to collect the data. However, I would never be able to kill the ones. The one in the formula will be there no matter how many millions I spend on the n. The n would kill the two other terms. It's not so clear the second term is killed by increasing n, but it is because the SXS, XXX is summing up terms. And if you sum up more and more terms, this will be basically go to zero also. Um, so the n would make this interval become the confidence interval can be as small as you want by increasing n. But the prediction, you will always have at least the individual person variability as part of it. That's just the name of the game. If you want to predict individuals, you cannot do better than the natural biological variability in the system that we are dealing with. Sometimes that could be small, other times it could be big, but it is what it is in a given context. So that was confidence intervals and prediction intervals. Should we? I'll, I'll just continue here, kind of just a sec on this one, just to let you know that there are functions in R that can do it for you. Here is a, it, it looks pretty nasty, I know, but uh, basically, just, I'm just having my height and weight. I'm plotting, I'm putting in the line with the AB line here. There are different ways to put in the line. This is one way. Um, I then look at what I do here. I use a function. There is a function called predict that you can apply to the results of your regression computation, right? You do your regression computation by the LM here. I save the result in a, something that I decide to call my fit. We talk about a fit of the model to the data, right? My fit. Then I predict from my fit, I use some data. It's a bit put into a lot of stuff here, but um, no, I use some data. I could use new data, but I could also just predict using the same data I used for the model. That's what I do here. You could also plug in other x values and predict on those if you want. And then, maybe slightly counter, uh, sort of intuitive on the names, I could either ask it to give me, even though the function is called predict, I could tell it, give me the confidence interval. Or I could tell it, Below, I say, now don't give me the confidence interval. It's the same function. Now give me the prediction interval. It's the same function that can do either based on whether you use one or the other option, right? And then the, the rest is just some R code to collect it and to plot. Again, there are other nice plotting functions in R, of course, but this is just to, uh, and then, of course, when things go wrong, let's see. Okay. Okay. 
Skal jeg prøve at fortryde det, eller hvad det bare Ja, tak. Tak for det. Det er sgu ikke op der. Yeah, here we had the confidence intervals and then we could have the prediction intervals. For some reason, I don't get them. We, we saw them previously. Let me not to go beside on the R. Let me show that what I showed you in the beginning. Here, that's what I tried to do here, but which I didn't quite succeed because I messed up with my fingers and the copying and whatever. But uh, hopefully it works in the R code that I shared with you when you do it to actually produce first the red one, the inner, the confidence interval. You can see how it becomes wider in the end, as I pointed out on the formula. And the green one actually also becoming wider at the end, but it's not very visible in this range, actually. So actually the, the one plays a major role in, it, in this um, uncertainty. So we can do that, and we can, so we can use the line in those two ways, either for doing estimates of means in sort of subpopulations, or for predicting individual observations. Same value, but different uncertainty. So I want to.